Lawrence has been undermined. But Nam, let me start with you. And this events of yesterday, well, they were they were of a scale that is uh, not normal. But this isn't a this isn't a, a flash in the pan. This is this has been building for some time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, first of all, um, to WEF for creating the platform for us to have this conversation. I'm dumbfounded by the idea that we can continue with business as usual, as if the crisis that we're facing in our country is not, in fact, a crisis, as it were. You will see in the news today in schools across Cape Town, um, young children are going to be out protesting because the serious of femicide in this country is that serious. This, the problem of femicide and gender-based violence across the continent, across the globe, is a problem. But I want to specifically focus on WEF because I came here originally, the idea was to talk about the sustainable development goals, that's what we do. But when you see the kind of spate we've seen, you kind of have to start asking the question, what can we do as a platform like the World Economic Forum to address this? And for me, I think two or three things stand at the top of my head. First, you have some of the most powerful African and global leaders here, particularly heads of business. Why it is that they haven't come together and said, how can we address this immediately? So for instance, um, interesting mechanisms like a, a, a gender-based violence fund, as an example, is something that we've been calling for out of the statement that we made. But also there are tech entrepreneurs who are here. There are technology companies, big data companies. Um, one of the things we are realizing in South Africa is that the increase in gender-based violence is now in our public spaces. But it's not just the public spaces, it's also where uh, people are supposed to be getting their social services. So the spaces where the poorest of the poor are supposed to be safest, where they're supposed to be getting help, is where they are actually becoming more and more vulnerable. It would take a click of a finger for a tech company to say, we're going to deploy a software that can assist us with an emergency response system for poor women in South Africa free of charge. Why has that not happened? If WEF doesn't exist for us to come up with creative mechanisms like that, not just to create value in economies, but also to support people so that we can live better lives, as it were. So that is my very strong call at WEF today. It is the tech entrepreneurs who are here, the tech companies who are here, the big data companies who are here. Can you deploy a solution, not just for South Africa, for Africa, where women can actually, it's something that women can use as an emergency response system to get help when they need help? Very tangible, and, and, and wishing you the very best of your luck. Have you had any conversations so far? I know you probably only arrived just this morning, so it's quite a few days yet. But what kind of indication are you that people really want to talk to you and, and you know, engage with you on this subject? So we've had very interesting responses. So the UN system in South Africa has fully endorsed the statement and this move. I met with the Ministry of Gender yesterday. They are talking about the fact that they are working on a gender-based violence strategy, as usual, but they have no money to actually implement it. And so they are themselves saying, Saying we need the funds, we need WEF to help us as it were. Um, what I have not seen enough energy around is in fact the business world, the business community. And I know that the business community is creative and has solutions to these things. We are having a meeting today at 12.30 and we've invited as, ma as many people as possible so we can actually come up with a strategy of how the business community can help us. And if there are individuals in this room who can assist us to think creatively about what we need to do to create safe sp spaces, we would be really keen for that. Okay, so 12.30, all, all of you from representing business in this room, please come to this meeting at 12.30. We've been hearing all over the past, uh, the past day of this meeting that business stands ready to help Africa in its, in its growth and development and invest and, and unlock regulation. So I think in this area, it's, something, it's an area that maybe has been overlooked but, but must not be for any longer. But let's go back to that business rationale, um, have said, which is a brilliant opportunity to bring you in as, a, as an economist and somebody who's also um, uh, you know, very, very embedded in this movement. What are, what are the economic costs? What is the cost of ignoring this crisis? Oh. I think the cost to Africa is that Africa will be left behind once again. Yeah. Do you know, um, for about 25 years I've been studying the question of how Africa will develop. I studied that at Harvard, I studied that at Tsinghua in China. And when I studied the question, I looked at, you look at how Europe and America developed, it was driven by the private sector. You look at Asia, how did Asia develop? It was driven by the states in Asia. But then when you look at Africa, neither private sector nor states are as strong as they were in Europe or in Asia and in the United States. But what we have in Africa that is so powerful and so strong is what? Is our community. Who drives the African communities? It's our women. 
And our women can drive Africa's development if given the chance, if protected, if their rights are respected. Take even China that through its own achievements alone on the Millennium Development Goals, the world achieved the targets for the Millennium Development Goals. The Chinese state drove the agenda for China. But the Chinese state, what they drove first of all was the protection of the Chinese woman. Because when they started, they were breaking the toes of Chinese women. You guys have all heard about feet binding. They were doing that in China. They were breaking the toes. There was polygamy in China. There were so many um, obstacles to women's advancement. They banned all of that. They made that illegal. Look at African countries. Which countries are banning polygamy? Which countries are actually enforcing the laws that are on their books on gender-based violence? Which countries are ensuring that girls are going to school and are not married before the age of 13? Sometimes they have laws. And in Africa, we often say the laws are there to bark, but not to bite. Mm -hmm. We need the laws to be enforced to protect the African women. Because it's the African women that are the engines that will drive. They're already doing so much. African women, among the world's women of entrepreneurs, we need the world's women of entrepreneurs in Africa. But we also lead the world's women of entrepreneurs whose businesses fail. Because the supporting environment, the enabling environment is not there. We're not being protected by the state. We're not being protected by society. The society does not seem to understand that this is our best chance at development and that we must do everything possible to protect this chance. So our organization, Women in Africa, convenes all, every year to look at this issue of how we support and empower and propel the African woman. Because without it, you know, the world, we, Africa missed the first industrial revolution. We missed the second. We missed the third. We don't address this issue, we will miss the fourth. And that's the challenge and the, put, and the, the, the danger that we're facing as a continent. It's, we're talking about South Africa, yep. but the issue in South Africa, you can replicate across Absolutely. the continent of Africa. Take Congo. Absolutely. The man that won the Nobel Peace Prize for Congo, um, he, he won it because he, he left Europe where he was a medical doctor to go and be um, putting back bodies of women who had been violated in rapes in the Congo. And not just women, also girls. And, he, and that's why he won the Nobel Prize, Dr. Mukwege. So this issue is not just here, unfortunately. It's across the continent. There are countries that are doing better than others, but there's no country that is sterling. Every country needs help, and we must take on this issue as a crisis. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Havsat. Obi, so I'm, I'm reading the, uh, the fact file that we put out on our website uh, to our six million um, unique visitors every month last night. Um, one of the facts that I find particularly shocking, within Africa, nearly half, around 45% of women and girls over 14 have experienced physical or sexual violence. So you have started a global movement in Nigeria, and kudos to you for that. But give, talk us through what had to be done to build that momentum that you actually led to change. Um, so, um we co-founded this organization um, and it was mostly driven by women and continues to be mostly driven by women. And uh, this is the Bring Back Our Girls movement when girls went to school and were abducted uh, from their classroom and no trace of them. And there was such tentativeness in any action toward rescuing them that we felt outraged. And, um, you know, mobilized our citizens' outrage uh, in a very constructive way to stay on the agenda. And that's my key point, staying on the agenda. Right. We just have a way of being flippant in the way we take on topics. So there is a fad that comes around, and everybody jumps on the fad. But we know that the matter of violence against women has such deep implications for whether a society is resilient and will be resilient, whether a society will be productive and competitive because it requires both sexes in the optimal level in order to actually achieve economic progress, whether a society will be stable, because you really need decent human beings in societies for its stability, whether a society will adhere to the rule of law, and knowing that no man, no woman is greater than any other as far as the law is concerned. But what we see is 
a situation that entrenches the perception. Now, when it's got to do with women, when it's got to do with girls, it's not that important. It's not a, it's not a policy topic. That must change. The matter of gender-based violence must be a policy topic. And what is necessary for that to happen is for us to find the way that it correlates to a whole lot of other impediments that stand in the way of progress of society. Look at a number of women that have been abused or violated or whose rights have been taken away from them. What it basically means is that they lack the agency. Why should anybody lack agency? Why should anybody be made to feel powerless in a society that understands that the power to make informed choices can determine how well the individual would do and then how well the community within which they operate can do. So I have been uh, persistent about the girls who were abducted uh, in my country because I actually think that the world lacks the moral, the moral pedestal to stand to ask girls and women to aspire if we cannot have the back of those who are vulnerable and prone to risk. Thank you, Obi. We'll come back to a couple of those points, but time is marching on, so we want to have time for, for questions and, and, and an exchange. Um, Akuzi, we, we spoke yesterday, actually, and one of the things that struck me was that uh, when you said that, you know, quite frankly, the creativity and innovation employed to keep African women down is amazing. There's a tremendous amount of erosion of social tolerance, and talk us through a little bit about that. And what, are, what are the starkest realities of the, the work that you do as a researcher? Thank you, Oliver, and thank you to the WEF for um, elevating this session to this level so that it can get the visibility and attention that it deserves. So the first thing I'll say, Oliver, is that um, as an African woman, the things that we're seeing the fruit of, like the violence and the protests that are going on here in Cape Town and in different parts of Africa, um, actually start within the home, right? So we've gotten a lot of attention here in Cape Town because a, a young lady named Uinene was murdered. She was raped and then bludgeoned to death. And that has um, sparked an outcry, um, one that should cause us to be quite sad, touched, and chilled, right? A young woman with a bright future ahead of her. But she's one of many. Yeah. There, there are uh, 16,000 cases of deaths in, in the form of violence against women here in South Africa a year. Um, over 60,000 cases of domestic violence are reported, and there's a high degree of under-reporting. Um, these, these are the facts. Here in South Africa, um, we're seeing figures as high as 40% of men saying that they uh, engage in domestic violence, and that's those who admit to it. Um, mm. there, there is a, a figure as high as 25% uh, of men have admitted to rape. And the, what's really startling is that of the people who admit to rape, three quarters of them say they've done it in their teenage years. So it's starting really early. The violence against women starts really early. And I'm quoting these South African statistics because we're here in Cape Town, because the issues have, have sparked out here. However, these issues are pervasive throughout Africa. Yeah. So let's just put that there. Um, coming back to the issues that you raised, Oliver, what I've noticed is that the, the uh, inequality and the violence against women's, women starts very early. And it starts in her home. It starts in the home where she was raised. And all of us are guilty of this. All of us need to check ourselves. All of us need to ask our question, ourselves the question, what are we doing to put the African woman down? So from birth, there are practices. And again, yes, they are creative, extremely creative practices in the war against women. So from birth, in childhood, there's a female genital mutilation that happens in that safety of someone's home a girl child is mutilated. 
And then as she grows, there's a concept of son preference that happens throughout her childhood. She's told that, you know, oh, mom is struggling to have a boy because she's not enough. She's told that, you know, when there's a boy child, then the family will be complete. She's told, well, you know, you're not enough because we need a, a son who will inherit the property. It's creative, it happens in different ways, but it happens across Africa. So then she grows up in this environment where she's recognizing that she's less than. She's less than a son, she's less. And then you go into the period of early marriage, okay? The point of agency. Well, she's told that she doesn't have a voice, she doesn't have agency until she's married. Because a marriage apparently is what gives her the right to be. And not just marriage, it's marriage with children. So these are all the obstacles that are set up against the African woman. That starts from when she's born, takes her through childhood, hits her in puberty and early, uh, early period of getting into marriage. Now she's, in, and she's going through the rituals. In some countries, young women, let's call a crime a crime. Young women are raped even by family members before going into marriage as a form of rite of passage. So I'm here to say that these crimes against women that are committed from infancy, through childhood, through teenage years, through marriage, through adulthood, should be called out as crimes. And that's my message to the African leaders who attend WEF, to presidents, to ministers, is that you need to begin a process of standing up to call crimes against women crimes. Well, when she's in marriage, there are other obstacles through the delivery process. Do you know how many women, rates of, of maternal mortality spike really high in Nigeria in particular, over other African countries, because there is stigma against women who are not able to deliver naturally through a, a vaginal delivery. They're being forced, children who are sitting in the breech position, who should be removed by C-section, are being forced to be delivered naturally because um, mothers-in-law and other people in the society and men have subjected, subjected women to feeling that they're not good enough unless they have the child back. And these things are absurd. But you see also that women have been invited to join this war against fellow women as those good lieutenants fighting their fellow women. So these things have to end. I, then as if that's not enough, widowhood practices, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Last point, Oliver. we want questions. Widowhood practices then continue where the woman, after her husband is dead, is not allowed to inherit property. In fact, she herself is then passed on to other relatives as inherited property, very pervasive throughout Africa. I'll stop there, but I want to encourage everyone to join this fight against violence against women. Some remarkably important points we'll come back to. First of all, quick sweep of the room. Who's got a question to ask, a comment, or an idea to make, to suggest? Okay, two, uh, let's get those, we'll take two at a time. Um, can you remind us, give us your name and remind us where you're from, please, and uh, we'll start with you, the lady at the back. Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Apio Winfred from Uganda, and I'm a global sh shaper from Kampala Hub. I just wanted to note that as a uh, base on what was shared by Ms. Mangaliso. It's very important for us to focus on coming up with technology that helps um, end gender-based violence, but we also need to take note of the fact that most of these technologies also bridge the gap, extend the gap that most women are facing and also perpetuate gender-based violence. Currently in Uganda, we're facing a very, very big uh, problem with, with uh, cyberbullying Cyber. or if uh, women's nudes being exposed. So yes, it's very, very important to also take note of how um, social media or how technology actually perpetuates gender-based violence, but then also increases the gap uh, between men and women. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so there's a big agenda when we talk to the tech companies because in many ways social media has helped raise this issue in the, the Me Too movement has been very much fueled by social media in a positive way. But of course you raised some really important points. Uh, lady in the uh, third, uh, third row back, yes please, do you have a microphone? And uh, we'll take after that the lady in the front. Uh, my name is Fatima, and I'm a global shaper as well from Morocco, the Casablanca hub. Um, so just a, a comment on the question, why aren't tech companies doing something in this space? I wanted to raise attention that there's a company uh, that does this. Uh, it's called Securella, and it's um, founded actually by a global shaper. Uh, it's been operating in South Africa, and it's an Internet of Things-based solution that allows women to uh, report uh, violence. Um, and now it's being rolled off to, to buses and school buses, and so that 
uh, passengers can report uh, violence. So I think the question then is how do we scale those solutions? How do we deploy them? How do we get the support of governments? Um, because the technology is there. A, a super point, really well made. And, uh, and Nan, if you don't know each other, you should definitely talk and, and go to yeah. the same meetings. Also, Robin, my colleague from Agenda, that would be a great story for us to get out to our, to our audience. So we love solution journalism, but the ideas, the great ideas that need to be scaled up. Um, okay, lady in the front row. Um, good morning, my name is Farana Parker, I'm from Cape Town and I'm a global shaper as well. I see all the global shapers. So for me, I, um, we acknowledge that gender-based violence, it's a wicked problem. So when we address it, there's multiple levels and of intervention and I'm currently um, conducting my research and I've decided to focus on prevention because there's a lack of preventative programs and looking at innovative pathways to scale gender-based, I'm specifically focusing on domestic violence in mothers given the statistics that show that women are predominantly affected. So for me, when, when we talk about what is the, because it's a multifaceted problem, if we could choose one, the, I, I, it's an open question to any one of you, is what, is what do we focus on, where do we start? Because there's various levels, it's from the housing sector to psychosocial development, building self-esteem to starting a fund. It's a great question. So yeah. single most uh, important intervention to start. <laughs> Let's go to, I think there's one more question. There's a gentleman at the back who isn't a global shaper, I don't think, but please uh, <laughs> feel free to correct me, it's very bad lighting. Yeah, um, good morning, thank you very much. Uh, I'm KK Fumba from Refinitiv, formerly known as Thompson Reuters. I have a problem. Um, we cannot win this fight with just women alone talking about this issue. Absolutely. It is absolutely unwinnable and I need a lot more men to please be involved. I mean, just look at the number from the audience alone, forget the panelists. This is the only way that we can win this. That's just the only comment I want to make. Thanks. A fine, a fine comment. Let's just attack, tackle this question. Um, we've only sadly got a couple of minutes. And Obi, you've got a meeting with our chairman, which is very important for this whole movement, so we can't delay you. Um, single most intervention, where do we start? Akudo. Great. I think we start with the leaders. We need champions. Yeah. Our presidents, the leaders in government need to come out and take a position. Uh, and one of the things we're doing is we're coming back to South Africa next year, June 9 to 12, to Durban, and we're having a summit here on women and girls that will focus on technology, involvement of males. There'll be a whole track on men. And we have health, we have education, policy and economic empowerment. We need to have a frank dialogue. We need to have our leaders come out and call crimes a crime. Th I think that's, that's the starting point. That's, that's great, because we have 30 seconds each to answer. I will say also, there are heroes. We had a conversation yesterday. There are sort of some real, some good heroic people uh, coming to the fore. Ethiopia has a 50% um, uh, female cabinet now. We see some good laws in, uh, in various states across uh, Nigeria and other, other countries regarding family law and equal opportunities. Obi, what's your 30 second answer to this very important question? Where do we start? I think we should stay on the issue and not flip flop. Good. Yeah. You know, until other interesting topics. It's worked for, it's worked for Bring Back Our yes, Girls. Sustained. And it's one of the issues raised uh, yeah. here in Cape Town is let's not have one month a year, let's have mm. 365 days. And I think it's a very important point. Have sat. I think we need to be talking to each other. Men and women need to be talking. You know the vagina mm. monologues? Was, uh, we brought that to Nigeria and had, um, women, and the Nigerian people, men, especially men, said, is this really happening in Nigeria? So we wrote the V monologues, the Nigerian story about our stories. And the men said, well, we also want to hear our stories. So we wrote also the Tarzan monologues. And then now we do a face-off where they perform side by side. And it's great because our societies, in, especially in African countries, are very conservative. These issues, we don't really talk about them. But we can come and watch a performance about them. People will laugh. People will cry. But people will come away changed. We're not, we're not looking for a war between men and women. We're looking for a new partnership based on respect. And we can build that understanding when we communicate with each other. Nam, what, last word to you. Voice. I think that we should break down every system, every structure where women's voices are not front and center or at least equal, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's in the policy space, whether it's in budgeting systems. We need to disrupt every system where the voice of women is not front and center because that's the only way you can make sure that women's issues, particularly gender-based violence, are addressed. We've got to build voice. 
Akuda, Obi, Hafsa, Nam, I salute you. I wish you the very best. We're here to support you at the world, as the World Economic Forum. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for watching us live on television or online. Yeah. This session's over. Thank you very much.